Hi, I'm Vicki Dalton, and normally I'm the Spokane County Auditor in charge of elections, licensing, recording, and financial services. But I'm also a knitter and a weaver. And this is one of my machines that I use to knit socks because I need all the stress relief I can get. Um, so this little machine was built in 1918 during World War I. And during World War I, it was really important for soldiers in the trenches in Europe to have clean, fresh socks because that was one of the real problems for soldiers was um, fungus and other diseases of the feet. And so there's this huge effort across the U.S. and across Canada and in England to knit socks for the soldiers. So these machines were being built. Some of them worked, some of them worked well, some of them didn't work so great. Um, but that was a huge effort going on. And uh, to give you an idea, if you're hand knitting a pair of socks, especially if you're me, um, it'll take a couple of weeks to get a pair of socks knitted by hand. Um, even the fastest folks, it usually takes uh, at least a full day to knit a pair of simple socks. On this machine, uh, there was a woman in Canada who literally could crank out a sock every hour. And that was a huge improvement. So these machines um, are pretty much in use today. Uh, socks that are made today are made on machines that work on the same principles. They're much bigger, they're much faster, they're much noisier, much more complicated, but it's gonna be the same basic process. So this was a huge advancement back in the 1910s as people moved from making things at home, making things by hand, to those everyday necessary items being made in an industrial setting. It changed our society, and that's why understanding how these work and what they produce is so important. It was a huge change in our society, in, in work, the work that was performed at home, or the work that was performed in the factories. So I'm ready now to show you a little bit about how this machine works. And one of the things I want you to pay attention to is not just how it moves, but pay attention to the sound. Because for anybody who works around machinery, you know that the sound the machine is making tells you as much as what your eyes are telling you as you're watching this particular machine work. So let's get down to it and let's make a little noise. The first thing is you have to thread it, you have to get it ready to capture stitches. So I'm going to show you how it works and then we'll talk a little bit about how each item in this comes together. So ready for some sound? So just cranking, hopefully you can hear that lovely noise of the needles just going up and down. Now, I'm holding on to it down below to give it some tension. If I was to let go and crank, literally everything would fly off. We have to pull those loops down, so I'm going to add some weight. This is called a buckle, and so the buckle just goes right on to the starter right there. So this is actually called get that on there a little better. So this little starter piece is called a bonnet. And this is about a three pound weight. You'll notice how far away from it my feet are. You do not want this to land on your toes because it hurts, speaking from experience. So now we're just about ready to crank. We're gonna add on the actual yarn that we're going to use to make a pair of socks. And so this is about what we're going to turn out. We're only going to do one color today, but this is two colors. So we're going to do a sock, and from the back you can see the heel and the toe. So we're just going to do a quick sock blank. So how long does it take to make a sock? Mm. I can usually do a sock in an evening. I'm not as fast as other folks are because again, I'm doing this to relax. So, 
So hand knitting one round would take me probably a good 10 minutes. You can see how fast that went. So now let's go a little faster. And that was already about three rounds. So now we're gonna add this color. And all I'm gonna do is pull it through. Change up my knot just a little bit. Because I don't wanna lose any tension. Just a simple overhand knot right there to keep it steady. That's color change. So now we're gonna crank about 40 rounds. Normally I would have my counter in place and this is my $13 bale counter from Big R. And every time I would go around, it would indicate um, an increase we're not gonna use it today because I'm trying to keep it out of the way of the shots. So here we go. That was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. We're almost there. 31, 32. Oops, a little bit of a knot there. 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and now we're at 40. And it's important to remember how many rows you do because you need to make a second sock exactly the same. And any knitter knows that is the toughest thing to do is to make that second sock the same. So on here, I have little markers that tell me where to do the heels. So keep in mind that you've got to have some place for your heel to go because really your foot and your leg are kind of an L. So that's what we're going to do here. We're just going to make a little pocket for the heel to go into. And it's the same on modern socks. This is exactly how modern socks are made. So that's what we're going to make is right there. So you can see how that sticks out. And this is where things can go wrong when you're knitting. So first we're going to um, bring the machine in and to bring the head in and start taking needles out of work. So now we're going to start going back and forth. So we don't want to work on the back needles. So I'm going to take a little less than half of the needles out of work. And it really does help to have trifocals when you get a little old to be able to see it. So we're not gonna be working on these. So now I need to put a little extra tension on because now we're gonna go back and forth. And we are just about there. So that's the first row of the heel. So now I'm going to bring those two out of work because what we're doing is we're going to go back and forth making shorter rows each time. So now we've taken the first two needles out of work on the first row. Now we're doing the second. You can see I go all the way past. Now I'm coming back and you see that spring is taking up that extra. Unfortunately, I have to put my hands in there to keep the extra tension on. And so if you listen carefully, you can tell when the head has gone past all the needles that are in working position. See that, hear that quiet? 
so it's no longer working. There we go. And we're just gonna go back and forth. And I do unfortunately have to put my hands in there in order to keep the stitches on. So as we're doing this really slowly, I'll try to keep my hand out of the way, watch as the needles go up and down. So the needle is gonna go up first and grab this thread. Then it's gonna go way down in and the little latch is gonna close over that new thread. And then it's gonna pull that new thread way down to make the new loop. And then as it comes back up, it literally pops the old loop off and over the, or pops the old loop, sorry, pops the old loop off and over the new loop. And it really is impossible to see, but hopefully we can find some diagrams that show how it works. So see, this one didn't quite pop all the way. So I need to do that with my hand. And that's because I didn't hold it down really well. So depending upon the size of the person's foot, you use cylinders with different number of needles in them. So on my machine, all the cylinders stay the same. It's about a four and a half inch diameter but the number of needles change. So in this one, um, this has got 60 needles to it. Um, I have others that have 80, and I even have one that has 100. Now, I was talking about um, World War I. That 100 needle cylinder was used to make fine gauze that were used to make bandages because there were a lot of surgeries and amputations in World War I. And so there were people who literally spent days making gauze for surgeries during World War I. So now you see that the weight has hit the, the, ra the rung down here and it's no longer providing adequate tension. So now I need to lift that. Notice my feet are way the heck out of the way. <laughs> It really hurts if you hit if your feet are under there and it drops. So back on it goes. So that one is up. So the other thing you can do for size is how many needles you leave when you just when you start the other side of the heel. So in this case, we're probably going to leave about probably 10 and that's going to make this part of the heel right here because we're not going to go to a total v-shape because that would be uncomfortable so we're going to do this part right here and we are almost there and there we go We've now reached that part of the heel where we're gonna start getting bigger again. So here we go. So now bringing the needles back into work, if I was just to bring this needle down in, it wouldn't catch the thread. So I'm gonna pick that yarn up and I'm gonna put it to the back of that needle. And what that does is it wraps the yarn around that needle so it makes sure that it catches it. Okay. And this is again where you really have to pay attention to the tension that you've got on the individual needles. Now in modern factories where no human is involved, of course, the equipment does it all automatically. 
So I'm sure most of you have um, socks that are colorful, that might have a lot of different um, colored threads in them, maybe even have patterns in them. Um, the machines that are in the factories today are amazing. They look like huge spider webs going on. And they still work on exactly this same principle. And this may look tedious, but if you've ever hand knitted a pair of socks, you know that this is definitely not as tedious as hand knitting. Okay, we are making progress. So now I've reached a point where I can hang another set of weights and not have to put my hand in here anymore. So this is called a heel fork. They come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. This is actually an old pastry cutter that I've cut in half, used some copper or brass wire to make spacers. So that's the other thing about these machines. You, you um, have to be creative and ingenious just to keep them running. So here's my second set of weights. So now I've got about six pounds in total hanging off the webbing on this machine. So for those of you who are really into equipment, you know that during World War I, metal was an essential war material. And so everybody had to turn in their metal. But because these were being made so that women could knit socks for soldiers in the trenches, these were also considered essential. But again, metal, incredibly hard to find. This one I'm really lucky. This cylinder is a high quality steel. And it's probably the most beautiful cylinder I've ever seen on any machine as far as just the quality of the metal. The housing, not so much. Um, the housing um, is a much lower grade steel. Um, this one does have chrome on it for its ring. Not all of them did. Um, I've got another machine where the cylinders are made from pot metal which contains zinc and lead, and the lead unfortunately melts at a very low temperature. And because of that, um, these cylinders usually didn't last very long. And a lot of cylinders that people find today are in fact um, not capable, are not functional. They're, they're warped, uh, they're broken, and um, they're just not workable which is really sad. So if they've been stored in attics and barns, there's a high probability that that machine does not work. So this machine took a lot of small purchases to finally get this one functional. And you can see that that latch keeps closing on me, so I have to keep opening it. If the latch is closed, it won't grab the yarn. We'll have a big hole, and that is not a happy moment. And we are almost done with the heel. Almost, almost, almost. Just a couple more rounds. So people ask me all the time, where can you get these machines? Well, they're not easy to find, but they can be found. Just Google uh, circular sock knitting machines on the internet. Um, there are a couple of folks in the U.S. that do sell and service these old machines and there is uh, one company that I know of in the U.S. that is currently making the machines. Um, it's based on a Gerhardt uh, which was built in Ohio in the 1910s and it is called 
in the modern age, an Erlbacher. So if you are interested in buying a new machine, then you can work with them. So we are ready now to go back into, into knitting in the round. So I've just finished the last of the heel. I'm gonna bring these back into work. So now they're back into work and I am feeling it to make sure that all the latches are open because really we do not want to um, do what's called blow a stitch. It's really not a good time. So now I can take that extra tension off and we can do another 40 rounds. And then we'll do the toe and we'll almost, but not quite, be done. So gotta pay attention to where the weights are. So that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and guess what, 40. So what that does is it produces a sock, a foot, that's that long. So what we'll do is we'll change color here so it makes it easier to see the toe. And usually I do about uh, 10 rounds before I start the toe because it just makes it look better on the foot. So all we need to do is, yeah, let's turn back here. Makes it easier to pull it through. So let's do blue. Now this is a little bit thicker yarn. So it'll give it a slightly different appearance. Okay, so now we'll do about 10 rows. And you'll notice once that weight hits down at the bottom, I lose my tension and I need to readjust. Now that the heel is down below the machine, just slide that buckle up. There we go. So let's do another 10 rounds. Make sure everything's caught. So that's one, two, three, four. Whoops. This is where it doesn't get fun. That's what I get for talking, not paying attention. So tell you what, we'll just continue on. Normally I would stop, fix all this. But since this is just a demonstration, we'll just keep right on going. Okay. See, not everything goes right all the time. Okay. So we'll just do a few more because now it doesn't really matter. <laughs> See, this is, it doesn't like this particular yarn. So what I would do is I would adjust this tension right here. So let's see if I take it down a little bit. That's gonna help. The 
we're just gonna fight our way through it. Okay, that did help a bit. I'll just have to slow down. So now we do essentially the heel all over again. And that's what forms the toe. And once we've got that done, then we have what's called a sock blank. And in commercial socks, that would be stitched closed on a special machine. What we would do is we would stitch it closed by hand. And I'll show you what that looks like. Always catch that. And so this is gonna be just a repeat of what we did with the heel. Hopefully without blowing a stitch. As you've already seen what that looks like. And so you can see that that's, that's a challenge with each one of these machines is getting the tension just right and knowing which of the many types of yarns a machine will work with and what it won't. So this machine here, for whatever reason, um, I can feed just about anything through it. It doesn't care if it's cotton or polyester or acrylic or wool, or a blend, I mean, it just goes, as long as I get the tension right. Um, the other machine I have is really picky. Um, it will not uh, do acrylic at all for some reason. It just sticks and throws stitches. But it loves pure wool. It just thinks pure wool is just fantastic. Okay, so we have reached the end for the toe, and we're gonna start bringing things back into work. So here we go. Needle down, yarn over. Now there are a couple of different ways to do this particular process. This is my preferred method. So some of you circular sock knitting um, enthusiasts out there are probably screaming at the tube right now saying, oh no, that's not the way to do it. Um, your method probably works really well for you. This is the method that works really well for me, provided I get the tension right. We are almost ready to put the other set of weights on. And then we will have a sock plank in just a minute. So here we go again. I'm gonna stick that weight in there. We try to get it right in the center of the heel. Because this yarn is a little bit thicker, the stitches are a little bit Tighter. Makes it a little more difficult for that pastry blender to go through. There we go. Okay. And how do I know what to do? I know that that thread's coming off of this needle, so this needle just knitted. I need to bring this needle into work and flip it back. And you can hear how much tension is on the machine. So if you really listen to the sound, you can hear just how hard this machine is working. I don't know if you can hear all those beautiful pops as the loops literally pop over the top of each needle. For those of us who do this, it's a glorious sound. And 
sometimes there's so much tension and so much weight, it takes a little extra force to get things to go where they need them to go. So normally when I'm demonstrating, um, I'm here one day at the fair and I'm usually here on Senior Citizen Day. And often that coincides um, with the day that a lot of the homeschool uh, folks come in. So usually I get about three different types of people watching me. Um, first we get the homeschool kids and they're just great because you know we talk about history and we talk about World War I, just some of the things I've talked to you already. And it's just fascinating to watch them when I explain, you know, your socks are made the same way and they look down at their socks and start watching and you know, their eyes go back and forth and back and forth. So it's really fascinating. Um, then I get the ladies who knit. Um, and of course they're fascinated because most of them hand knit and they understand just how much effort it is to make a pair of socks. And it's fun having that conversation with them about the difference between hand knitting and, and cranking this machine. Then I get the folks who come in with somebody else and they are so not interested. They're getting drug into this demonstration. They really don't want to be there. And a lot of them are, are folks who uh, work around machinery. And they have this look. And, and so I'll start talking to them just about the mechanics of this. This is such an elegant design. It does what it needs to do. It doesn't do anything more than it needs to do to produce the product that it's meant to produce. It's a very simple needle with a latch that closes so that the old loop slides over the top. It's got a hook that catches the new yarn at the appropriate time. This housing here has a deep V in it. And so the, sorry guys, they are called butts. So these needle butts are caught in a groove and it pulls the needle up and down so that the needle will grab the yarn, pull an appropriate amount of yarn down to form the loop, and then pushes the needle back up so that the old loop then flips off. It's beautiful. And it takes very little to make it happen. Just springs, a little bit of metal, some gears, and a crank, and a human to move it. And so, I really enjoy talking with um, the folks who are, whoops, there we go, playing around too much, um, to talking with the folks who are mechanically inclined um, because it's just such elegant motion to make the product. So I believe we have just one more row to go and then we'll pull it off the machine and you'll see what a sock blank looks like. And again, this is exactly what's produced at the modern era to make a sock. So right there, we are almost done. So we're gonna bring all these needles back in because in order to make a sock blank, you have to do that last little bit that protects the, the loops from raveling. So what we'll do is I need enough yarn to stitch this close by hand. So we're gonna take it about there. We're gonna tie on a little piece of waste yarn. And yes, your fingers get a little oily. And the number of times I have sliced myself doing this, you know, sometimes it takes a little blood to make the project work well. So now I'm gonna to go to where the edge of the toe would be. We're gonna pull that through. Take that off. We're gonna pull that through. on 
to that so it's got tension. I'm going to get this out of the way before we end it up outside. And how many times have I reused the same piece? This is probably on about its 50th pair of socks. So how many socks have I done? I started using one of these in, oh geez, probably 2003, 2004 maybe? I don't know, sometime back. It's been not quite 20 years. Um, I stopped counting at 200 pairs and that was a long time ago. They're fun to do, it's addictive, especially if you're a knitter, you know what I mean. Okay, so before we take it off the machine, it's really, really important to get those weights off because you do not want that falling down. It is not a good thing. So now we're gonna take it off the machine and you're gonna see what a sock blank is. Here we go. Now, this is how you blow stitches. Ready? See, there's no yarn going into the needle and it's just throwing that old stitch off. Now, there are ways to fix it, but let's not go there today. So there you go. This is waste yarn. This is the actual leg of the sock. Here's the heel. Here's the foot. And here's our slightly messed up toe. And then this will get stitched closed. You can see the waste yarn. So this part of the toe will get stitched too. Let's see if I can do this. To this part of the toe, and there you go. Now you've got a toe. Exactly how they do it in modern socks. So here is what that will look like when we finish. And I didn't do a really good job, that's why you can see it right there. Most of the time you can't see that row. It looks just like the rest of it. This one, I must have been watching something on TV that was really fascinating because I wasn't paying attention. And so there you have it. There's your sock blank, and there is your finished sock. So this takes me about 30 minutes because I'm really slow because I'm always watching television when I'm doing it. Other folks can get this done in about five minutes, not me. So there you go. Socks during World War I.